Good morning. Wasn't that beautiful? Isn't the lady that sang it beautiful? Oh, oh, man. If I wasn't already married to her, I'd ask her out today, that's for sure. Maybe I should ask her out anyways because I am married to her, huh? You ought to do that. I'm glad you're here today. I know it's summer and we have a lot of folks out, but I'm glad that you've chosen to be here today. I'm, I'm, I'm emotional today. I'm emotional today for two reasons. First of all, it's a good reason. So it was exactly nine years ago on this Sunday that Vicki and I came to Hollywood Community Church. And so, um, so thank you. Thank you for putting up with us for nine years. Um, we've been in ministry for about 35, 36 years. And I can honestly say this is, without a doubt, the most rewarding experience that we have had. And so uh, I just want to thank you so much for loving us, for being patient with us. I wish, I wish I was a better pastor. I wish I was a better preacher. I wish I was um, better at a lot of things. But I, I appreciate so much your patience with us and your loving us and locking arms with us for us to make a difference in our community. And so thank you so much for that. The other, the other reason is, I'm sure you're aware of the two shootings that occurred uh, yesterday. And I want us to pause and pray for the people of El Paso. And then I woke up early this morning and I was shocked to see that there was another shooting in Dayton, Ohio. So 20 killed in El Paso yesterday, 24 injured. Nine killed last night in Dayton, Ohio, and 16 injured. And I think we as a church need to cry out for those people. We need to pray for them, pray for those cities. Could have been our city. Thank God it wasn't. And we need to pray for them, and we need to pray for our country as well. So would you join me today? Let's take a moment and pray for those. Lord, I cannot begin to imagine the heartache that families are experiencing in El Paso and Dayton. Lord, our heart goes out to them. I pray that you would minister to them, be with them, comfort them, especially the families who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are injured in the hospital. Father, we pray for doctors. and We pray that you, the supreme doctor, would work in their lives, save their lives. We pray for them. We pray for those communities which are broken today, are hurting today. Lord, I pray for the leaders of those communities as they try to rally their communities together. I pray for the pastors in those communities today as they try to comfort those families Minister to those families. Answer questions that are impossible or very difficult to answer as to why and how and all of those things. So, God, we pray for them. Lord, we pray for our country. God, help us to make wise decisions. I pray for leaders, Lord, who, who would honor you and would, and would seek you. And, Father, would make wise decisions, Lord, as to how to stop these tragedies, these tragic shootings from taking place. So, Father, we entrust all of this to you. We pray for our communities, and thank you so much for our law, law enforcement personnel and our first responders. We thank you so much for them. And so, God, Lord, we realize that we live in a fallen world. We're reminded today again how very much we need you. So, Lord, I pray that you would show yourself strong in our lives, in our marriages, in our families. Drive us to our knees, as Paul says in this passage. Help us to be men and women of prayer. Help us to be a church that prays for one another, realizing that the answer to all of our problems is found in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We honor you. We recognize you. We worship you today. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
If you have your Bibles, take your Bibles with me today and turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. So, boy, let me uh, kind of put a lightness over the mood today, a little bit more. So, let me ask you today, what is your favorite movie sequel? All right, just think through that. You don't have to yell it out. So, what is your favorite movie sequel? Obviously, a sequel is the second or third or the fourth round of a movie. The vast majority of Hollywood's most successful movies have banked off that success by creating sequels or additional versions of the original movie. So let me just share with you today the, uh, the movies with the most sequels. You might already know this. Rocky has, does anybody know? Seven sequels. Rocky has seven sequels. Harry Potter has eight sequels. The X-Men have eight sequels. Star Wars, I think I'm correct. If, if I'm wrong, please correct me afterward. I believe Star Wars has eight sequels. Is that right, David? Does Star Wars have eight sequels? Is that right? The last one hasn't come out yet. I know there's one more coming out yet. I know that. Somebody told me that yesterday as well. But up to now, we're, we're right. Star Wars has eight sequels. Batman has nine sequels. Ten if you count the Lego version of Batman. And James Bond has 24 sequels. All right. Who hasn't watched James Bond, huh? Well, my point is this, that just like the movie industry has sequels, the Bible contains some sequels of its own. The the Bible has times in which it teaches us something, it shows us something, and comes right back and gives us, as it were, a sequel or a second version to that. Last week we studied Paul's first recorded prayer in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. And by the way, wasn't Brad's message a powerful message last Sunday? It was powerful and it was convicting as well. If you didn't get a chance to hear it, I'd encourage you to go to our website or go to our YouTube channel and you can watch the message. Here is the the gist of Brad's message last week. You and I have been granted the power of Christ's resurrection. Let's live like we have it. We have been granted the power of Christ's resurrection. Let's live like we have it and let's pray for one another, understanding the power that is truly available to us. Well, today we find the sequel. And so we have simply titled today's message, Pray for Your Church (laughs) 2. Last week, Brad preached on Pray for Your Church. This is Pray for Your Church 2. It's a sequel. Ephesians 1, as we mentioned, contained the first prayer. And the passage that we're looking at today, Ephesians 3, 14 through 21, contain the second prayer prayer. Now some would argue, and as I read this week, some would argue that the epistle of Ephesians, all of Ephesians, is prayer material. Not just what we studied last week and not just what we're going to study today, but all of the book of Ephesians is prayer material. And others would say that one of the purpose that one of the purposes that Paul had, and most definitely one of the purposes of the Holy Spirit in this book of Ephesians is this. It's, it's the goal to teach us to pray. God wants us to pray. I read this week a quote from Eugene Peterson. I think I'm going to put it up on the screen. Eugene Peterson says this. He says, prayer is the cradle language of the church. Think about that. I love that quote. Prayer is the cradle language of the church. It is our mother tongue. In other words, as believers, that should be the very first language that we speak. I tried to illustrate it this way. I just spoke in in our Spanish congregation a few uh, moments ago, and I appreciate them so very much. Most of the people in our Spanish congregation are first-generation immigrants to the United States. They're people that have come from Venezuela. They come from the Dominican Republic. They've come from Cuba. They've come from other places here, and many of them are still just learning English, and I'm so thrilled that we have a Spanish service for them every single Sunday that they can worship the Lord in their Spanish tongue. But one of the things that they're finding is that the second generation, their kids and their grandkids are losing the ability to speak their native language. 
those second and third generation people that have come from the Dominican Republic and Venezuela and Puerto Rico and different places no longer have the ability to speak their native language. They have fully adapted into the American culture and they only speak English. Now, I would say that to a certain degree, that's happening in the church as well. You see, first-generation believers, and some of you here today would be first-generation believers. Others of us would be second-generation believers or third-generation believers. First-generation believers seem to understand a little bit more than others the importance of prayer. And as they come to Christ, they are driven to their knees. And prayer is their prayer language. It's their language that they communicate with God. But sadly, what often happens, and it's not status quo for sure, but what often happens is we lose that urgency to pray. And we begin to figure out how to do the Christian life on our own, and as a result, we in our minds think we don't need God as much as we truly do need God. And so I believe with all of my heart that one of the purposes of the book of Ephesians is to teach us to pray. I apologize for us to be men and women of prayer. I got it right here, Evan. Let me put it to the back. All right. All right. I think we're good. If it does it again, I'll go to another mic. So we're in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning of verse 14. We're just going to kind of walk through this passage, and I trust it'll be applicable for you today. So Ephesians chapter 3, notice in verse 14 what Paul says. Paul says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Let's pause there for a second because if you've read through this epistle, you know that this is the third time that Paul uses the phrase, for this reason. It was actually in the prayer that Brad spoke on last week in Ephesians chapter 1. He actually begins that passage of the prayer saying, for this reason. If you get to the beginning of chapter 3, he begins chapter 3 with the exact same phrase, for this reason. As we get to verse 14 of chapter 3, for the third time he uses that phrase, for this reason. What is Paul talking about? I believe that Paul is basically saying this, realize who you are in Jesus Christ. And realizing who we are in Jesus Christ drives us to our knees. Let me just review with you. And we didn't study chapter 2, but in chapter 2 and verse 5, Paul says this, You and I were dead in our sins, but because of Jesus Christ, we have been made alive. In verse 8, he says that you and I have been saved, not from works, not from our own goodness, but we have been saved by our grace. It's a gift of God. In verse 10 of chapter 2, he says, you are his workmanship. The, the Greek word actually is you're God's masterpiece. You're God's poem. He's creating something of beauty. He's creating something of value in you. And then verse 14 of chapter 2 says this, you are united with other believers in Christ. He actually talks about, in chapter 2, racial diversity. And he talks about the fact that Jews and Gentiles from two different traditions can come together and they are one body in Christ. That's what I love about Hollywood Community Church is I look out across our congregation today, I see all kinds of different faces that look completely different. We come from different backgrounds, different traditions, different cultures, but when we come together, we're what? We are one in Jesus Christ. And Paul mentions that, and so then he comes to chapter 3, having understood all of that, and he says, for this reason, understanding all of that. He says, I bow my knees before the Father. Verse 15, he says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Basically what he's saying in verse 15 is this. He's saying, God's sovereign. (laughs) He's saying, everyone, everything, whether in heaven or whether in earth, are under the fatherhood, under the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. And then Paul goes through, and we're going to flesh it out. Paul goes through and he prays for three specific requests. 
It's a little difficult to see in the English, but three specific requests. The first request is found in verse 16. The second request is found in verse 18. And the third request is found in the latter part of verse 19. In the original language, they all begin with the word that. So Paul is praying that, this purpose clause, asking God to do something specific in the life of the Ephesians, and thus asking God to do something specific in our life as well. These three petitions that we're going to look at not only demonstrate what God desires to do in your life and mine, but they also give us an example as to how we should pray for others. And so that's why we're calling this Pray for Your Church 2, the sequel. And let me just go back and rehearse just a, a point that Brad made last week and made it so well because we have a tendency for our prayers to be somewhat shallow. We pray for health, we pray for money, we pray for provision, we pray for all of those things, and those are things for which we should pray. But we often fail to pray for the deeper things. We often fail to pray for God to do a powerful work in our lives that only He can do. And so our purpose of this series, Praying Scripture, is for us to say, okay, God, when I don't know what to say, when I don't know what to pray, what should I pray? And here in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul gives us three very practical requests that we ought to be praying for one another, that parents ought to be praying for their kids, that we ought to be praying for our, fan, our friends and our family, and our fans too. I think that's what I was going to say, right? Yeah. And we ought to be praying for our church. So notice the first request, verse 16. Notice what Paul says. That according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So the first thing Paul says is this, pray for spiritual power. Now, now you might be able to tell the wording in English is just a little bit awkward as, as, as that's translated trying to say exactly what the Apostle Paul is praying for. But basically, there's, there, there's two things that Paul says about this divine power that is available for us. The first thing he says is not only pray for power, but pray that your inner man is strengthened. So Paul, Paul is not speaking about our physical condition. He's not looking at us and saying, here's the deal, you've got to hit the gym just a little bit more often. You've got to pump those weights. You've got to get in physical shape. That's not what the Apostle Paul is talking about. He's not talking about our willpower. He's not talking about our self-determination. He's not talking about improved character on our part, nor is he talking about self-improvement. Here's what he's talking about. He's talking about a radical change that takes place in your life and mine. A radical change to your interior, to my interior, to your inner man, to your inner woman. A radical change that can only be accomplished through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. He's not talking about turning over a new leaf. He's not talking about New Year's resolutions. He's not talking about a determination to change and to do something. All of those are good things. But that's not what Paul is talking about in this passage. He's talking about a change that occurs in your life and mine, something that we cannot produce, that only the Holy Spirit of God can produce. He says that strength that will be found in your inner man. The phrase that he uses uh, inner being, actually in the, in the ESV, is found only three times in the New Testament. It's found here in this passage. It's found in Romans chapter 7 and verse 22. We won't look there. But it's also found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. Notice what Paul says. Paul says, so we don't lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away. Can anybody relate this morning? Though our outer self is wasting away, I woke up this morning, honest truth, both of my knees hurt, my, my feet hurt, my back hurt this morning, and I thought, oh my word, my outer self is wasting away. 
Can I get a witness this morning? Are you like that today, all right? Paul says, although our outer self is wasting away. Some of your young ones are thinking, what in the world is he talking about? It's coming, all right? It's coming. Though our outer self is wasting away, Paul says, our inner self, same word that's found in the passage we're studying today, our inner being is being renewed day by day. So here's what Paul says. It doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. What really matters is what's happening on the inside. And the Holy Spirit of God can take a body that is wasting away and He can change us from the inside out. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about. So here's my question for you today. It's a question that I've asked myself this week. Is God changing you? Would you think about that for a second? Is God changing you? Is the Holy Spirit of God strengthening you? Are you now overcoming what previously overcame you? Are you experiencing in your life what the Apostle Paul is talking about? This inner strengthening that, that, that God is giving you. This, this, all of a sudden, this newfound victory over sins which previously defeated you. Paul says, that is something for which we ought to be praying. So let me ask you this. What if we prayed this? for one another on a regular basis. Husbands, what if you prayed this for your wife? Rather than pray that your wife would be submissive, <laughs> I'm sure none of the guys ever pray that, right? Or, or wives, rather than praying that your husband would be uh, kind when he comes home from work and interested in you and all of that, those are all good things. What if we prayed that the Holy Spirit of God would produce a change in our spouse? Mom and dads, what if we prayed that for our kids? What if we sat back and said, God, listen, okay, I want my kids to go to a good school. I want my kids to be successful. I want my kids to do all of this. But God, more than anything else, I want my kids to be strengthened in their inner man by the Holy Spirit of God. A change, God, that only you can produce in their life. What if we prayed that as a church for ourselves and for others? So here's what I want to do for a second. I want to pause. Would you bow your head right now? And would you pray that for yourself? Let's just take a minute. Pray that. Pray that the Holy Spirit of God would strengthen you in your inner man. Pray that for your family as well. God, forgive us of a dependence upon ourselves. Forgive us of an independence from you. Forgive us of a false understanding that we can do it on our own, that we can change, that we can make the necessary transformation in our life that we can overcome a sin, we can overcome a temptation, we can become the husbands, we can become the wives, we can become the parents you want us to be. Forgive us of that self-dependency and remind us that those things can only be accomplished on the inside by the power of the Holy Spirit of God and produce that in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a second part to this petition that Paul mentions. Paul says this in, in the latter part, or, or, or in verse 17, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So here's what Paul is praying. Paul is praying, so listen, I'm praying in Ephesians that, that the Holy Spirit of God would strengthen you on the inside, and that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith. I gotta admit, I, I struggled with this one just a little bit. Not because I don't want it to happen, but rather because I thought, God, hasn't this already happened? <laughs> I mean, don't we pray and ask Jesus to come into our heart? I mean, when we trust Christ as Savior, we pray and we ask Jesus to come into our hearts. 
And so I sat back and thought, wait a second, didn't that happen? Didn't Jesus come into my heart when I gave my life for him or to him? Why would I pray for something that Jesus has already done? And the more I dug into this, I found a truth that is incredibly profound and incredibly practical. Here's what it means, and I put it this way in your outline. It's this. It means that Christ is settled in your heart. That's what the word actually means. When it talks about dwell, that Christ would dwell in your heart, the idea is that he would be settled there. To, To use a different word, it would mean this, that he would be comfortable there. That as as Christ lives in your heart, he would be comfortable living in my heart and yours. It made me think, several years ago I was invited to preach a a youth camp down in Peru. And so I, I flew into Lima, Peru, and then hopped in a car and went two hours south from Lima, what seemed like the middle of nowhere to this camp. Now, you have to understand that I am very much of a city boy, right? And and camping is not my forte. Vicky's a camper. I'm not a camper, all right? I never understood. Her family sometimes will camp out in their backyard. And I'm like, I'm like, okay, let's figure this out. There's a bed 20 feet away and you're sleeping in a tent in your backyard. And Vicky knows, I slept in the house while they slept in the tent in the backyard. So, so camp, it's tough for me. So I'm going down to this camp in Peru, and I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what in the world am I getting myself into? This isn't just a camp in the United States. This is a camp in a different country. Well, I get down there, and it, it's unbelievable. In this rustic camp, they went out of their way to make me feel at home. So they gave me a private room at this camp with my own bathroom. They went and bought brand new bedding for the bed, brand new sheets, brand new pillows, brand new comforters. There were fruit and candy on the nightstand right there. And I walked in and thought, I can camp like this. I can camp like this for more than just a couple of days. Now, you might be thinking, man, Brian's just a spoiled city boy. That's exactly what I am, all right? So I went down to this rustic camp. Hundreds of Peruvian young people are camping. They're roughing it. And, man, I felt as home as could be. Hot showers, nice clean bed to go back into, fruit and candy when I went back to my room. Here's what they made me do in a, in a difficult place. They made me feel comfortable. Now, think about that. Think about that. Do you make Jesus feel comfortable in your heart? He's living there. Your body is the temple of God. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. He is living there. But do you make him feel comfortable there? And and here, pulling this all together, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit desires to powerfully change your inner being. He desires to powerfully change my inner being so that now my complaining becomes rejoicing. He desires to change me to such a degree that my sinful thoughts now become pure thoughts. The Holy Spirit changes me so that my anger is now under control. He changes me so that now my mind is saturated by the Word of God. He changes me so now I think of others before I think of myself. He changes me to such a degree that Christ is settled in my heart. He feels at home in my heart. How can that happen That can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit of God as he's changing you and he's changing me. So here's what Paul says. Pray for spiritual power. There's a second thing that Paul says. Notice 17b as we go on. 17, Paul says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. There's a line that you, comma, being rooted and grounded in love. To our English majors there, Paul's mixing his metaphors. There's an agricultural metaphor. There's a building metaphor. So that you might be rooted and grounded in love, might have strength to comprehend with all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. 
and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. The key word in all of that is the word comprehend. In verse 18, Paul says that you may have the strength to comprehend. Now, you might sit back and say, wait a second, I don't need strength to understand or to, to, to comprehend. That's, a, that's an intellectual exercise. What is the Apostle Paul talking about? But the word comprehend here means more than just intellectual comprehension. Here's the way I wrote it in my notes, if you have your outline in front of you. He said, here's what Paul says. Pray to understand and to take hold of the love of Christ. The, the word comprehend there maybe would be better translated to apprehend, to, to grab a hold of it, to not just intellectually know it, but for that truth to become a part of your DNA, for you to understand the love of Christ so much so that it changes you. Paul is saying you can understand something without making it your own. But the word here has the idea of seizing. It has the idea of grasping the truth of God's love. And Notice how Paul fleshes it out. He says, understand the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of Christ's love. Some would have us to believe that those are different manifestations of God's love, that the height means one thing, the depth means something else, the breadth means something else, and some have suggested that. Rather, I think they simply show how big God's love is for us. It's so big that it has to be measured by its width, by its breadth, by its height, and by its depth. God loves you, He loves me in such a way that it's impossible for us to measure. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. Some writers have said this, we underappreciate God's love. And I, and I would think that's true. Don't, 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 don't get mad at me as the messenger, but I think we underappreciate God's love. I think I underappreciate God's love. I think you underappreciate God's love. We understand it, but on a regular basis, we don't take hold of it. Think with me for just a moment. We ch to truly know the dimensions of Christ's love, we have to know what it cost Him. True love costs something, right? Paul says it this way, as simple as it can be, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated His love for us. How? And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's love for us cost something. It's free to us, but it cost Him something. Probably the first verse you ever memorized, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He what? He gave His only Son. He sacrificed something. True love sacrifices. True love gives itself away on behalf of something else, on behalf of someone else. That's what God has done for us. We have to know, we have to grasp what that cost Him. But we also have to know how little we deserve it. Think about that. How little we deserve God's love. You and I haven't done anything, will never do anything, and can't do anything to deserve God's love. Think about that. We haven't done anything, will never do anything, and can't do anything to deserve God's love. It is what? It is given to us by grace. It is undeserved. It is unmerited. In order for us to appreciate it, we have to understand it. And Paul fleshes that out just a little bit more in the, in the passage. Let me give you four truths, and I just put them there so you can write them down. Let me give you four truths that we need to grasp in order to fully understand the love of God. Paul says this, first of all. First of all, he says, it doesn't happen alone, it happens in community. So notice what he says, that you being rooted and grounded in love may, may have strength to comprehend, what does it say? With all the saints... So the idea is not, go lock yourself in a closet and understand God's love. Paul says, no, 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 no. The love of God is best understood in community. It's not best understood individually. It's best understood when we are with the body of believers, all saints. Why is that? 
Because I see what God's doing in your life. And you see what God is doing in my life. I've experienced the forgiveness of God, and you've experienced the forgiveness of God. And jointly together, we get this greater appreciation for God's love. There's a second thing that Paul says. Paul says, it is a never-ending process. So it's not like you're going to sit back and say, oh, yeah, okay, I get it, yeah. Yeah. Finally, I get it. Kind of like a joke that went right over your head. And you didn't get it at first, but now all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, now I get it. Okay, finally I comprehend God's love. Paul says, no, no, no. Here's what Paul says. Paul says, to know the love of Christ that what? That surpasses knowledge. What does that mean? It means you will never fully comprehend the love of Christ. It's a lifelong journey. Here's the third thing he says is this. It doesn't come naturally, but it comes supernaturally. How can you know something that is beyond your ability to know? So so Paul actually gives what, what we call a paradox in the passage. He says that you might know something that is beyond knowledge. How can you know something that is beyond knowledge, that, that surpasses your understanding and my understanding? The only way we can know it is through the teaching and the power of the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. God gives us this ability to comprehend it. He gives us this ability to understand that it is only through the Holy Spirit working in your life that you truly come to understand, appreciate, and embrace God's love for you and for others. Notice the fourth thing. It's already up there. It leads to spiritual maturity. So so many believe that these three petitions are cumulative That they're not three separate petitions, but that Paul is praying, follow me, that they would be strengthened in their inner being by the power of the Holy Spirit so that they would fully understand the love of God with breadth, length, height, so that the third petition, which is found at the end of verse 19, which demonstrates spiritual maturity, Verse 19 says, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So so the third petition that I mentioned to your outline is this, pray to be filled up with God. Let me tell you what that doesn't mean. Don't jump to a conclusion, all right? Pray to be filled up with God. Let me clarify that Paul is not saying that we need more of God. Paul is not saying that God's given us a portion of himself and we got to beg him for the rest of himself. That's not what Paul is saying. I don't believe to use the terminology that Paul is talking about a second filling of the Holy Spirit. I personally believe that we received all of the Holy Spirit the moment that we trusted Christ as personal Savior. I believe his exhortation is more practical. Here's what Paul is saying. Let me illustrate it. Paul is saying to be filled up with God means that the attributes, the heart, and the power of the divine nature is fully alive in your life and mine. Let me say that again. The attributes of God, the heart of God, the power of the divine nature is fully alive in us. God God continually manifests himself through our lives. I'm, man, I tried my best. How can I illustrate this? And in my finite brain, I, I, I tried to illustrate, and the best illustration I could come up with, not a good one, but an adequate one. So let me give you an adequate illustration, all right? The, ed- the best illustration I could come up with was my sun pass. All right, how many of you have a sun pass on your car, right? All of you have a sun pass on your car. Somebody told me when I moved to Florida, I, I, it's going to take me a while to learn to live there, and it took me a while. Part of it uh, is because I'm just hard-headed and I don't get it. So when I first bought my sun pass, I think it gave me an option. Do you want to put a credit card so it automatically replenishes itself? And I'm like, no way, Jose. I'm not giving anybody my credit card, so I'm not going to do that. So I didn't replenish it. And so all of a sudden, I'm using, I'm driving the turnpike around here, and half the time you don't even know whether you're being charged or not, you know. And you're charged, and all of a sudden, I get an email that says, your son pass is no longer valid if you don't pay this because you have a negative account. And I'm like, oh my word, what can I do? And so what I did is I gave my credit card information. And so now, whenever my balance goes below $10, what happens? $25 is automatically replenished 
in my account. Now, obviously, I'm paying for it. Wouldn't it be great if the government was just putting $25 in my account? But they're not just putting $25 in my account. I'm paying for it. But the idea is this. It never runs dry. It, 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 it always replenishes itself. I don't ever have to worry about trying to go through a toll booth and all of a sudden they say, ah, you can't go through because you have no money and your son passed. My son passed is constantly replenishing itself. So when Paul says this, pray to be filled with the fullness of God. Paul, Paul is saying, here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that God is constantly replenishing himself in your life and mine. That as a child of God, as we've already seen in chapter 2, someone who has passed from death unto life, someone who has been saved by grace through faith, someone who is God's workmanship in which he is creating in me something new, someone who is part of the body of Christ, God is saying this, I want you to understand that now in me you have everything you need. It is never going to run dry. Understand that. And why is it, church, that we at times go from defeat to defeat instead of going from victory to victory? Why is it that we don't understand who we are in Christ and what we have in Christ? Paul says this, and he said it in the first prayer, man, that our eyes would be opened so that we would understand who we are and what we have. Pray to be filled up. With God. I love this quote from A.W. Tozier. A.W. Tozier said this, and it's a little bit of a critique on churches, and I get it. He said, Modern religious focuses upon filling the churches with people. The true gospel emphasizes filling people with God. Think about that. Our goal, I love seeing this place full. Summer's kind of, I struggle a little bit in summers because we have so many people gone. All right, I love seeing this place full. Any pastor loves to see his building filled. But my job is not to fill this building. My job is to help you and me to be filled with God. For us to be the men and women who God desires for us to be. I sit back and think, what an intercessory prayer. What if we truly prayed this prayer for one another? I thought, I thought, man, what if parents prayed this prayer for their kids? Mom and dads, and I alluded to it just a few moments ago, so I don't want to beat a dead horse, but what if instead of praying for all the things that we pray for, and none of those things are badly, but we sit back and we said, okay, God, the number one request of my life is I want my kids to be filled up with God. I want them to know you experientially. I want them to know you intellectually. I want them to experience your power in my life. I want them to have, to, for their inner being, to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit of God so that they, they might fully understand the love of God, its length, its height, its breadth, its depth, and that they would know that in them God has placed everything that they need. What if we prayed that as parents? And that was the number one prayer of our hearts. God, do something in my child's life. What if we prayed that for our friends? What if we prayed that for our church? What if we really took this admonition to heart? Pray for your church too. What if we prayed that for one another? Brad challenged us to do that last week, and I challenge you as well. Let me show you one more thing, and I'm done. Paul not only shows us how to pray in this passage, but he gives us three transformational truths. And I want you to see these transformational truths because they, the, I use the word transformational not just as a descriptive adjective, but if you grasp a hold of these, they will truly transform your life and mine. The first is this, understanding and believing the depth of God's love for me is the key to my growing into a loving person. Allow that to sink into you. Understanding and believing the depth of God's love for me is the key to my growing into a loving person. You ever seen a believer that's not loving? <laughs> that should be an anomaly. 
How can a believer who has been changed by the love of Jesus Christ not demonstrate the love of Christ? How can that happen? It's because we fully don't understand and comprehend the love of God. Here to summarize it, let me just say it this way. God loves everyone. Say that with me today. God loves everyone. Say it again. God loves everyone. God loves your unkind and overly demanding boss. God loves your LGBT neighbor who lives right beside you. God loves Democrats, and God loves Republicans. He loves both of them. God loves the people who were killed in yesterday's attacks. And yes, God loves the men who perpetrated that atrocity. God loves everyone. To love like him, you have to understand his love. And if we don't love like him, it's that we don't understand his love or we don't believe his love. Second truth. Second truth is this. Understanding, believing the power of the Holy Spirit in me enables me to see God do more than I could ever ask or think. Understanding, believing the power of the Holy Spirit in me enables me to see God do more than I can ever ask or think. Do you understand today that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you? The all-powerful, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent Holy Spirit of God lives in you today. That's what Paul is saying. Notice what he says then in verse 20. We didn't get to it. He says, now. So he says, ends all of that. Then he says, now, to him who is able to do more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Who is him? It's not you. (laughs) It's not me. Who is it? It's the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us. Now to him who is able to do far more than we could ever ask or think according to the power at work within us. As a believer, you have that power in your life. As Brad said last week, you have it. Act like it. Claim it. Paul says this, understanding, believing the power of the Holy Spirit in me enables me to see God do more than I could ever ask or think. And the final truth is this, understanding and believing God's plan for me prompts me to continue to give him praise or continually to give him praise and glory. Verse 21, he says, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. So when I see God doing things in me that I could never imagine, when I see God working in and through me in ways that just absolutely blow me away, when I see God changing me and I'm, I'm becoming the man that I never thought I could be, and my family is becoming the family that I never thought it could be, and I experience that, who gets all the honor and glory? He gets all the honor and glory. Now to Him be glory and honor in the church forever and ever and ever and ever. When I understand that, He truly gets the glory. What a way to pray. What a way to pray. Church, may God help us to pray for our church. May God help us to pray for one another. May God help us to pray for our families. And may we experience what Paul is talking about in this passage. Would you stand with me? Jonas and the team are going to come and in just a moment, we're going to sing about the love of Christ, which we, which we just saw in the passage here. So before we do that, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you today. Father, I pray for every individual here this morning. I pray first of all for those who don't have a personal relationship with you. 
There hasn't been a time in their life when they realized their need of you. They realized that they were a sinner and they confessed, they repented of their sins and by faith they turned to Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray for those individuals today, whoever they are, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God at this moment, at this moment, would convict them of their sin. Show them their need for Jesus. And Lord, either where they're sitting or here at an altar, Lord, I pray that they would give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for those of us who are believers. There's already been a time in our life when we gave our life to you, Father. I pray that each and every one of us would be strengthened in our inner being by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I pray that Christ would be at home in our hearts, that the words that we say, our actions, our motives, our responses, all of those things would make him feel comfortable. Help us to understand your love, to understand your love to such a degree that we love even the people that are difficult to love. Help us to love them as Jesus loves them. And Lord, I pray that we might be filled up with God that we would understand that in Jesus we have absolutely everything we need. You replenish day after day, moment after moment. You replenish everything we need so that we can be the children that you desire for us to be. And to you, we promise to give all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.